and I'll hide the video panel so we don't all get broadcast across the recording. And let's get going. So just to reiterate, there are two sessions this week you'll see recorded. The content session, so I've plucked a lot out of tonight and put it in the content session. It's online for you there already. I've also posted these PowerPoint slides in case there's something useful there that you want to recap. And also this session will be recorded and posted into the subject Moodle. So um, you'll be have a double whammy this week. And if that's favorably reviewed, I may in fact continue that practice just so that we're not spending our whole um, 55 minutes or 60 minutes together talking about content. So let's have a look. Let's go straight to the forums this week. And I really want you, if you can, please, to, to ask any questions that you may have in relation to the forums. I had some very, very good um, questions this week and people are really starting to fine tune. I noticed that we're really grinding down onto the, the, the focus of the questions and the assessment this week. So it's, it's really, really good to see. Um, Candace had a very good question that she raised about tables, graphs, charts and word limits. Um, she's had another lecturer actually say that, you know, graphs, tables, charts don't, don't actually figure in word limit. And look, I, I would probably endorse that, but not for the same reasons that some lecturers would. I mean, my view is that when you're doing an editorial piece like a paper or a discussion and you include a table, that you're actually spending words in your discussion talking about that table or talking about that graph or you're looking at a chart and you're doing the interpretation. So you can't just drop a chart or a table or a graph into a piece of work passively and say, well, there you go, voila, there's the data and then leave the reader to do all the work. So you've, you've done the analytical work in your discussion. And so for that reason, we don't count the table as words because you're spending additional words on interpretation and integration of that table into your argument. So it's a really good question. Um, and you're absolutely right. Tables won't be counted. Graphs won't be counted. Charts don't get counted. But the reason for that is not because they're not words, but because you're spending other words explaining and incorporating them into your discussion. So we don't double count them. Um, Paula had a really, really good question on um, a diagnostic tool. And um, it was a very insightful question. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll just bring it and spring it up here on, on the page. Um, there it is there, it's coming up. And Paula's question was this. And I'll just enlarge it so we can see it. A quick question, please. Is there any need to justify why we cho choose to use the type of diagnostic tool we have in part A? I've seen one in the examples that someone spent a lot of time doing so. For example, I used a concept cartoon coupled with questions. Do I need to back that decision up with research? I have checked the criteria sheet and I'm thinking, no, I don't need to spend time on this, but I thought I would check. Well, please have a do, do have a good look um, because the criteria sheet does mention that you are you know, supposed to back your judgment with current research in education. Um, and so yeah, we call this concept constructive alignment. And I've put in here a reference to a guy called John Biggs. Um, the work actually goes back to an Australian in the 1940s and 50s called Tyler. But what he basically says is this, and, and you know, coherence between constructive alignment is coherence between assessment, teaching strategies, and intended learning outcomes in an educational program. So what does that mean for you? Your learning sequence is an educational program. So there has to be coherence between the assessment, the teaching strategies, and the intended learning outcomes. So in essence, you need to say why you have used your diagnostic tool. You need to stipulate, you can't just pluck it out of the sky and say, this diagnostic approach actually sheds some light on my pedagogy. The diagnostic approach, we've got to hear the assessment, the teaching strategy, and your intended outcome link up. And your choice of diagnostic tool is your attempt to do that. Uh, I've given you a reference here to the side of the University of Dublin, a great little resource there on John Biggs's work. He's used exclu you know, almost exclusively in adult education, but um, when we do talk about serious curriculum issues, we talk about constructive alignment. That is, the assessment tools you use must be connected to, to your teaching strategy, and they must also articulate or, or resonate with your intended outcome. And that's what we call constructive alignment. In this assignment, that means that you do have to make a comment. I'm using cartoons because. My learners are young, cartoons are visual, there's not too much text, they're going to be simple, it's going to isolate and identify the concept for me. Whatever your reason is, okay, make sure you state it because that indicates pedagogical thinking and that's what we're trying to assess here. Okay, so I'll just pull that one down. A very good question there and I really appreciated that one from Paula. Um, Carly uh, had a question on reporting and learning. 
Now, this one's come up a fair bit too, and, and um, it, it's a, an interesting um, issue that we're having with this one um, in how we actually incorporate this into our assignment. Um, so Carly actually produced uh, this question. And again, just to highlight, um, and hopefully you're reading the forums because the stuff that comes up in the forums is just gold. I'm almost finished assessment task. However, I'm still unsure how to go about addressing the criteria, report your findings to students and parents givers. Notice that doesn't say reporting. That says report your findings to students and parents carers. So we're actually talking here loosely about reporting through a conferencing process or scenario. So what advice would you give to someone who's currently too poor to purchase the current textbooks? Ouch, that's going to hurt. Um, would there be good websites? I've actually sent her to New Zealand because um, the New Zealand system actually embraces this approach quite heavily. But there's a couple of things to look at here um, and a couple of things that, you know, when you're using um, an integrated approach of reporting, there's a range of ways you can do it. I'm suggesting here a conferencing model. I'm not suggesting that you actually get onto one school and put grades. It's not, not talking about grading here. We're talking about reporting learning. So we're talking about learning. And so the way we do that is we conference. And you, um, it's just something you're already doing as a teacher. Notice here that you've got a couple of things here. We conference about student feedback, student reflection, and student assessment. We do that already. We do it walking around our classrooms. All I'm saying is if you organise it and turn that into a formal sequence, and I refer here to my own teaching experience, I always, no matter what class I taught, I had a two-week cycle where I got round to every student and had a five-minute interview. I had a schedule. Every student knew when they were on, and of course, some of the, the disorganised students miss, you know, and they, they lose track. But eventually, um, by the end of the cycle and the year and the term, they, they know that, that they've got interviews coming up at least once a fortnight, and they know that I'm going to talk to them either about feedback, reflection, or assessment. And in that dialogue, I am collating enough evidence that if their parents walked in the door 10 minutes later, um, I've, got, I've got a recent conversation with the student. I've got a recent conference with them. I know where they're at. I know what their learning's happening. Um, and this is the sort of reporting back that I'm talking about. And there's a range of ways of doing it. You can use a portfolio, okay? A collection of their drawings, stories, science investigations, presentations. And you can share your observation of the child's actions, reactions, and interactions. Now, I put interactions in there really for the early childhood people you know, and, and the younger primary um, because it's really important. We're focusing very much on socialisation there, aren't we? We're focusing very much on bringing the child uh, in, into a shared space. So it's really important to note interactions as well. Um, you could build an e-portfolio, uh, a blog or a wiki, get the student to post it online and when a parent comes to talk or even when you even sit down with the student, you can conference about what's going on in that blog. You've got a running record. Before and after unit concept map, a really interesting one. Okay, let's do a concept map at the diagnosis stage. All right, summative stage. You've completed your final investigation. Okay, let's now link these concepts together. Let's fill in some of the blanks. And you've got a before and after. Wonderful summary of, of teaching. You can talk to anybody about the student's movement there. Science notebook is journaling. Now, those of you who are using the Science by Doing site, you'll be well tuned to this. You can actually set up a learning journal. In your journal, I want you to create three tables. In those tables, I want you to put in the following terms. So the student is self, you're building metacognition here. So the learner is looking at their own process and they're putting together an ongoing learning journal. All you need to do is sit down with them. If you want to have a parent teacher night or a parent interview, bring your science book along, let's talk. Let's look at the journal. You've got it all there for you. So you know, just create evidence. And when you create evidence, create examples and discuss growth, progress, ability level in social situations as well as academically. Um, and this is a conversation. You know, when we talk about assessment task number one, we're talking about assessment. So it's a conversation about the mastery of understanding and skills. So you know, make sure you, you comment on that in assessment task number one. There's no one way to do it. As I said, I did it with, a, you know, I just used my teacher's logbook. I logged um, an interview with students every two weeks. If someone was absent, we had to do a catch-up. Essentially, it took, you know, five five-minute interviews per class for me. Um, but at the same time, um, because we had a really interesting independent learning model going in all of those classes, um, I was able to actually follow that cycle through and have an up-to-date um, reporting, teaching, learning, uh, evaluative cycle happening 24-7. So think about that one. It was an excellent question. So I really appreciate that one from Carly. Um, and um, please do have a good look at it when you're thinking about your own answer for assessment task number one. It's an important criteria, but we don't have to go all formal. We don't have to start leaving wet spots around the place. The fact is, you know, assessment 
is is and, and reporting is, is is a very normal piece of the teaching cycle it's nothing for us to get excited about we are probably already doing it and if we organize ourselves and and we do it you know systematically it's not something extra that we need to do it's something we can embed in our practice so just that one for you there um Cindy's seeking help, and thank goodness someone jumped up and responded to her and helped her out. And she raised some very, very, very good questions in here, and I really appreciate Cindy jumping up and do this because um, not many people are willing to put themselves out on a limb, and she did that and asked some very, very good questions. So if you've got any fundamental questions about what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it, go and have a look at Cindy's post because I've responded to those questions in there, um, and hopefully... Um, Hopefully that there's something in there for you. I won't go to it because some of you are beyond that stage and there's no point going back in areas you're dealt with quite successfully. Loretta had a really interesting post too on stage versus age data analysis. Um, and I think this referred to just from memory, um, uh, Loretta's um, sample involved students of different learning age groups. Um, so how do you tackle that? And what counts as data in a scenario like that? Well, what I'll do here is I'll refer you all to this week's content lesson. Now, it's posted already. It's in there. And in there, we've got the teacher, Matt. Now, Matt's come down from Science by Doing. And yes, he's working with an older age group. Um, but bear in mind, you could find yourself, if you're a primary teacher, working with this same group. But what he does is quite, quite clever. And we see him using um, his... Really, he's, he's using his diagnostic skills. He does a session on diagnostic assessment. And in this session, he works with a group of students on cycles of the moon. Okay, it's a very, very good session. Now, he has in his mind the concept he wants to teach. But you'll notice in that video, he doesn't start with that concept. And this is what we're talking about with the Redis question here. Stage versus age data analysis. He doesn't start with the concept he wants to, to teach. He goes back and asks what, important, what is important about the moon. And he says to the kids, you know, I, I don't want a scientific answer. I, I want whatever you're thinking. Throw it out there. And they, they just throw it out there. And as a result, he's able to produce a really, really good concept map, really, really good data map. And then he weaves in where he wants to begin. Once he's mapped out the terrain, he then is ready to bring in the particular misconception that he wants to tease out. And he actually does a, a post-lesson post um, review on that one. Um, so have a look at this week's content screencast because that's exactly what you were asking you to do. And I'm getting a lot of emails from students saying, oh, do I just teach one misconception? How do I do that? Well, trust your instinct. You can't teach one misconception. And you don't stand up there and say to students, what is this? Or who can tell me uh, what the third cycle of the moon is? Um, because what you're asking for is the right answer. You're not asking for what they think, for what is real. Now, we've got to break down the dichotomy here between real understanding and book understanding. You know, we can't let book understanding rule, but book understanding is what we're trying to move them towards. And we can only get there by starting with real understandings. So let's not ask them for a book answer because, let's face it, there could be three or four in the class who know it. Everyone else is experiencing failure. Ask them what they know. And from there, build. And that's done brilliantly in, in this week's content screencast. Matt does a fabulous job. No need for me to report to and, and, and repeat too much more of what he says there. And Maxine has um, a, a really good question here on diagnostic testing. Now, I may have misunderstood her question at the, at the time, and I think I perhaps did. Um, and maybe I'll call Maxine in here to talk about this because I know she's online. Um, but she sent me a, a message and, uh, that basically said there was no misconception, so she was going to reteach something. And again... I just want to remind you, where there's no misconception, um, don't, don't take that as no misconception. That is a gap in knowledge. That is a misconception. If students say that's simply the way the world is or that's how it is, um, you know, that's what we call a macro level uh, misconception. And we talked about this in last week's lecture, macro, micro and symbolic. Now, we don't expect kids to, at primary level to get symbolic stuff. We don't. They'll get some micro stuff. But really, we expect them to be able to observe the macro world. That is the world as it happens. They can observe things. They can see animals. They can see plants. They can dissect plants. Okay? They can watch the stars and the moons. They can see energy change. They can cause energy changes through their interactions. So they can function in this macro environment quite well. Now, someone was going to say something there. And Maxine, I might ask you to talk about what, what you were referring to here, if you would. Um, yeah. 
sorry. Um, I've just, I was just a little bit confused at the time because I was, because I, like you said, I knew there was a gap of knowledge that they didn't understand. And I knew that I had to go and reteach it, but I just was not con was confused because I was like, is it a misconception? Is it classified as a misconception? So I was like, yeah, I didn't really know. I was really, really confused. And it took me a lot of reading stuff and also your email to then understand the third one that it actually is a misconception. When you go and look at the data that I collected, I just did not see it at, in the beginning of it. But, but by doing research and a lot of reading, I did understand it by the end, but it took a lot of hours. <laughs> Well, well done. I mean, it doesn't surprise me. You're very committed and very dedicated. And, you know, I think that'll serve you so well when you get to the classroom, Maxine. That's just brilliant. So you heard from Maxine herself there. Now, in, in week, I think it's week seven or eight, we actually look at, at this a little bit more um, as to where students actually make misconceptions and, and what we call hierarchical misconceptions. And, and for different learners, I mean, there is, believe it or not, there's a, there's a matrix there where you can actually look at your science concept and you can almost predict what the misconceptions are going to be based on this matrix because that the research has documented them well. We don't need to know that because we've got to teach on our feet. Okay, we don't need to remember that, oh, this could be a misconception. What we need to do is work with the people in front of us. We've got to throw it out there, we've got to gather it in, and we've got to have the right size net so that the bits we need don't slip through the holes. And we can't do that if we're looking for right answers. So we've got to gather everything in front of us. Any other questions or comments about uh, issues that have been raised on the forum this week that anyone would like to raise before we get going? Doesn't matter what, what you're thinking or feeling, or, or I mean, there's no such thing as a silly question. If there's something you want to ask, this is a good time. I have, so. I have one, Colin. Loretta, how are you? Yes, um, yes, good, thanks. And you, all good? Very well, thank you. Um, my... Um, focus of uh, misconception um, is highlighting other elements of the curriculum um, that only reflect in years seven and eight that are introduced into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. But it's something that my research has come up and identified that this is a concept that my age group should be aware of. So it's um, yet in only one research document, it states that, but I agree with uh, the researcher. Um, but if I have to include that in, uh, if I have to go through what I've already put together, I've used the five E's model, then the three stage framework. Um, if I have to look at including something like that, I'm going to just allude to it in my my um, assessment rather than and saying that this is something I would have a prior to my yes to this misconception because it's <laughs> science I mean science is not just one um, focus area there's so many elements that come into it um, the, the 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 issue I have is gravity yes for the children to under understand the only concept that they actually go through prior to um, year seven and eight is uh, like a push-pull effect or the forces or motion and that. They don't actually, there's no, um, nothing in the, the, the earlier years that covers gravity. Um, yet everything you teach is gravity, <laughs> which is... Yes, yeah. So I, I, have, I have that dilemma and I'm thinking uh, if I just allude to that, that uh, I would have covered that... Um, an element of that in, within a prior lesson? Look, that ab absolutely. Um, that's, and that's a really good question. And again, I'll point, point to today's screen con uh, cast um, that I've actually put up there on the content lecture. In there, there's a teacher called Kim. And Kim does a review of, of a biosphere um, lesson. And in that, that lesson, she actually wanted to, to launch ahead and teach a concept but she actually realised that she needed to go back and reteach some other concepts. Now, you're not Kim. You don't have a group of students in front of you. And our, our lesson sequence is imagined. And Loretta, what you're doing is absolutely spot on. If you can see perhaps an avenue where there may be a misconception that hasn't been covered, just make a note. And just in that note, just indicate this issue may come up at this stage and may need additional teaching. That's all you need to do. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Thank yeah. You. And that's... Sorry, 
Mine was actually the same also. All the research people said that you need to introduce um, solids, liquids, and gases, but then just concentrate on solids and gases because liquid, liquid, no, sorry, um, solid and li liquids, and then concentrate on only that because gases will be too hard for them in the early years. So I just kind of did that, and then I just introduced gases, but then, like, only focus on the two solids and liquids because... That's what they said, all the research papers. I was in the same predicament. Yeah, spot on, Maxine. That's exactly what you've got to do. You're making pedagogical decisions here and you're supporting them with evidence and you're supporting them with practice. That's what this assessment task is all about. Um, look, we could go on and teach the entire science curriculum and, and I'd come back next year and you'd still be doing this assignment. That's not the goal. The goal is to bite off something, analyse it and come up with a teaching sequence to deal with it. And it sounds like you've done exactly what you're meant to have done. Thank you. And it gets grey and it gets complex, doesn't it? It leaves you out there in, in that sort of, and, oh, look, I'm swimming around here in this spacesuit. I mean, it's floating about. Um, you know, what is the right answer? And, and look, the right answer is what comes up in front of you. Now, I talked about this probably a week or two ago when I introduced Etienne Wenger, who talks about design for learning. And that's all the curriculum is. It's a design for learning. But it doesn't actually deal with emergent learning, which is a whole other side avenue. We've got the design, which is our main road, and running on the main road, we've got a whole lot of arterials we call emergent learning. Not every student is going to be on that arterial, but some will be. And your job as a teacher is on the fly to constantly go around and herd those loose cats, to bring them back onto the arterial road. And all you can do, and as Loretta pointed out, and as if you've done, Maxine, if you can see a potential arterial, just saying this point may need to be addressed. Just a little postscript or a little note you're aware of it and your marker will look at that and actually say that's fantastic you know you've got 360 vision here that you're teaching this one concept but you're aware of other things that are going to pop up on the periphery you don't need to address them all you need to do is state your awareness because you would think on your feet as a teacher and then you'd work out how to address them there and then that's not this assignment you don't have a class in front of you all you need to do is identify any potential pitfalls is, does that make you feel more comfortable with that or that creating much better thanks colin good good yeah i'll just i'll just include it uh with the my exploratory stage i'll um, make a note of that yeah because i think it will come up students will, will address that so I, I need to include that yeah thank you and look more and more teachers are teaching gravity as a force in in, in the forces their unit so yeah they're bringing it back down the curriculum yeah all right, let's, um, let's move on. I'll just talk briefly about, uh, and please fire away any questions. As I know there's um, about 13 of you out there and I know quite a few of you being a little bit quiet. So um, I know you must have some questions too. Um, I'd really like to hear what they are. Um, this week we begin with an overview and we talk, you know, there's, there's Gregson 8.4. Um, what, what are the factors? And we know that a teacher works, you know, in, in, in this, this ever-shrinking funnel. And, and the funnel, of course, is time. Um, we have students for just a couple of hours a day and in there we're meant to deliver a compulsory curriculum covering all um, Australian um, uh, uh, curriculum standards and, and topics. Um, we know that we've got national testing and we've got that tension. We've got constant ongoing assessment in our classroom and we're also dealing with the social, emotional, psychological and psychosexual effects of, of, of you know, being in a class of 20 odd kids um, and, and their development in that process. So. Um, it's, it's a really, really hot little cesspool, the teaching role, and you're constantly vigilant, you're constantly on guard, you know, you're the sheepdog really in, in the classroom. And, and so assessment's changed, you know, and this is the point we're trying to make. Um, and and it, we're now required to, you know, just collect data. And, and, and this data is meant to inform your practice and also your students' progress. Now, this is heavily written right throughout the early years framework too. So there's really not much difference between the Australian curriculum and the early years curriculum. Um, it really is very much about data-driven and evidence-based practice. So assessments move down this path. And, and so some of the things we need to do is be able to define, describe and explain its different types. And I think we're pretty good at that. You know, you're a good group of students. The understanding's there, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. The key words we talk about criteria. 
um, feedback, formative assessment, summative assessment. Again, I'm not going to spend any time on that, just to point you to it that really they're, they're the terms we're using here. You know what criteria are. You've been doing assessment of your own um, for many, many years now. Um, feedback, again, it's got to be appropriate and timely and it's got to target learning behaviours and performance. Formative assessment, is, okay, it's got to be timely again. Um, and it's got to be short. You know, this is the thinking on your feet. This is on the fly stuff, formative assessment. And summative assessment, of course, has got to be varied and got to be of quality. Um, there's no point using the same assessment item because really students you find and research proves uh, using the same assessment technique, um, performance diminishes over time because children basically become unmotivated. So a couple of things we talk about this week too. Um, so what is assessment? It's about forming jud judgments. It's different to gradings. Grading is about allocating levels of performance. And why do we assess? And you can see there there's five, you know, five reasons that come out of Gregson and also Lockley, Luxley. Uh, it's a government requirement, um, you know, which is really sad, but it is. Um, and it's, you know, I remember working in a sheltered workshop when I was going through university. And, and I know it's a terrible term. It's not used this day, but that's what it was. It was, it was the... Um, uh, uh, I can't remember the name, started with E. Uh, there's charity up here too. Um, but they, they had a sheltered workshop and they needed a HR manager. And so I, I applied for the job. And, and um, every Friday, one of my favourite things was that in, instead of assessing each other, they used to write little notes to each other and put them in their fuzzy bags. Now, a fuzzy bag, some of you may know it, is, is you know, in this case, was just a manila folder with their little personal identities and their favourite sayings and everything stuck all over them. And every, every Friday, you know, three quarters of an hour before finish time, we'd, we'd stop and we'd have fuzzy bag writing time and they'd all get so excited. They'd grab their notes and, pay, and they'd go around and they'd write each other notes and drop them in. And, and that was our assessment. You know, it was peer assessment and it was all about job related performance. Went very well. They loved it. And it was quite, you know, at, this, at that time was quite uh, unusual. So assessment doesn't have to be uh, entirely formal, but in the schooling sector, because it's tied to high stakes outcomes and it's tied to social opportunities and it's tied to economic futures, um, it's required of teachers. And it's required of schools. And twice a year, there's a very heavy assessment item uh, and, and, and sequence put in place, a compulsory one. Um, we try to diagnose learning outcomes. And, and we do this to look at effective teaching strategies. We try to find feedback to students and teachers. Um, and that's what diagnostics does. It feeds back to students. But it's actually extremely important to teachers. Now, I know it's a little bit selfish, but it's something teachers do. We feed back for ourselves and we use those diagnostics so we know where to start. We know where to pitch and, you know, we have the arterial. We can then build the arterial and we can consider the emergent roads that, that, that pop up around us, you know. So they're the sorts of reasons we use diagnostics. We get to grade students. Um, so then we can actually look at, you know, stretching them out and differentiating. Grading, you know, we sometimes look at it as a negative thing. It's, you know, it's the only hammer you have, it's the only tool you have, but then, you know, you hit things with a hammer. But grading is the tool we have. But that tool can be used sensitively and it can be used creatively and it can be used in innovative ways to extend students, to differentiate between students, to create individualised programs, not punish, not degrade, not humiliate, but to, you know, or to shame, but to actually extend and differentiate. And, and that's the focus that we try to work on as teachers. And of course, motivating students. Assessment must be motivating. Um, yeah, and here, so some of the models that they look at with, you know, traffic light models and thumbs up, thumbs down, all of these little things at the diagnostic stage are extremely motivating because it gets instant feedback, keeps even a child with the shortest attention span, it can keep them um, totally, um, totally occupied and totally focused. And one of the favourite strategies that we've got going here in Townsville, actually, is the, the icy pole sticks. Is anyone using that in their, their classrooms? Where every student gets their name on an icy pole stick? Anyone relate to that one? And instead of asking for hands up, the teacher just pulls out the jar and all the icy pole sticks there and instantly all the kids just freeze and stare at the icy pole stick, wondering, is my name going to be pulled out? It's brilliant. So there's no pushing for hands. There's no jumping up and down. There's no urging. Um, and it's totally democratic. Anybody could be chosen. And the teacher can basically just reach in, pull out a stick and ask a question to anybody. And they're all attentive. They're all sitting there waiting. Um, it's motivating. You know, it's got that beautiful wait time. It's got the anticipation, all the things that we do. Um, and it's a very, very good questioning technique. So the aim of assessment really here is our, our bell curve. Um, and this is what we try to look at. Um, the whole NAPLAN system is built around this. Um, and then the bell curves for each individual institution are compared. And we finish up with a league table, um, which is a little bit sad. Um, in years to come, I'm just wondering how this will impact on teachers. 
I know in Townsville at the moment, we're currently recruiting teachers from New Zealand to fill our classrooms. So we're having a teacher shortage here already. I know the same is happening in Brisbane and on the Sunshine Coast. So when we start to get schools with low scores on, on, on NAPLAN and, and low scores on the, the, the you know, school performance indicators, um, we're starting to see staff not wanting to go to those schools. So we are starting now in schooling to reproduce a spatial inequality, um, which is really what schooling was designed to try and prevent. So we, if you like, we're becoming part of the problem um, and we're becoming part of the problem very, very quickly. And I do think that, you know, the league tables and the NAPLAN tables have pushed us there quicker than we needed to be. But essentially three types of assessment, and that's one of the things we need to understand this week. Learning, uh, assessment for learning, assessment of learning, and assessment as learning. And of course, really, assessment task number one fits in there. Science by doing. Um, Professor Goodman talks about um, assessment driving learning and the connections between history and assessment practice. It's all about observation and measurement. Um, and in science and education, the challenge is that the common end unit test is, is usually about transmission learning. You know, in other words, I'll just get my can opener, open my head, and I'll get a cup and I'll open your heads, and I'll just scoop in my cup and pour little bits into your heads and then stitch it all back up. Unfortunately, um, you know, they tend to, as, as we talk about, in Queensland, we went through a period of rich tasks and productive pedagogies. Um, so it's not about memorization, it's actually about actively learning, being active learners deep thinking, deep learning, deep conversations, all of these concepts coming through. So if we're going to fill their heads purely with content, if we're talking only science understandings, then we're talking memorization and low level. And, and of course, Bloom covers this for us very much, very well in his hierarchy. Assessment, um, the beginning, middle and end parts of assessment process. I won't talk too much about that. We know this. Diagnostic assessment obviously lends its analogies to the medical field. Um, in the medical field, we also have triage, which is really you know, interesting. Um, when you diagnose someone, you then instantly go into triage. You know, what's, I mean, I worked with medical education in Queensland Health uh, you know, for the four years prior to joining the CTU. Um, and triage is very important. You know, you've got four stages of triage and instantly once a teacher, the same thing again, you diagnose with assessment. And then we have a process, a learning sequence where we start to actually triage our learners build in our core concepts, identify our core, core misconceptions, and then set about a sequence, you know, of, if you like, intellectual antibiotics or, or ideational antibiotics that are going to help deal with the infection of a misconception. So it's the same sort of model and principle. Socio-cultural constructivism, people like Randall Pinkett, um, great thinkers. Pinkett wrote a lot about uh, 2003 up to 2008 and, and still writing now, um, but some of his best stuff came out around them. Um, but he talked about socio-cultural constructivism um, and, and if learning is a constructive process and an experience and it's important, it really is important to know what the picture of, of students' ideas are and, and we know this. Many students have got strong ideas and they've come from their experiences, you know, so that their misconceptions are included in this as well as their positive conceptions as well. Many of the misconceptions are based on common language, okay, so often what we have to do is reprogram, linguistic reprogramming. Others are based on direct experience. You know, they've seen the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, and therefore they can agree with Ptolemy. They get it. Okay. Sorting it. Here's the point we we're making before. We've got to sort real understandings, the students' understandings, from book understandings. And in order to do that, to make that dissection, we need to go through diagnosis. I know it sounds horribly clinical, but when we look at it, it's not clinical. Okay. It can be a lot of fun. Thumbs up, thumbs down, flashcards. Okay, getting them to talk to each other, kind of just analysing their talk. But we must also be, be aware that we've got to avoid faking good. And diagnose, you know, assessment task number one was about diagnostics. And if your diagnostic test is asking students for the right answer, okay, then it's not a very good diagnostic test. I'll give you that feedback now. If you're asking them to explain a concept or tell you what a concept is, then you're looking for right answerism. You're looking for the faking good. And instantly the students that don't know that are switching off. So you're never going to know what they do know. You're never going to have that starting point in their lives. So diagnostic testing is mainly for you as a teacher. And remember that, you know, and it's, it is your invitation to get inside these learners' heads. Anybody want to comment on that in, in terms of the, their own diagnostic tool? Um, People want to share examples of what they did with their diagnostic tool? Um, Colin, I designed a um, 
uh, worksheet that the students would complete and uh, there was just four or five very basic questions um, and it was either a yes or no. So basically just to, um, to get the understanding of content um, and then allowing them to draw um, their understanding um, because understanding that um, a lot of students don't have the correct scientific um, terminologies um, and they don't even have their own understanding in their own language, in the English language, um, some of them would use a drawing and you'd see a better understanding through drawing. So my, my worksheet allowed them to answer questions and then provide a drawing of their understanding. Fabulous, Loretta. And, and look, I must apologise to you all for this too, because this assessment task has forced you into a kind of diagnosis um, with your students and your learners that, that is, it can be evidenced. And in, in other words, you've got to capture it somehow. And so Loretta's used a worksheet. And, and in your natural environment, Loretta, you may not use a worksheet. You may use something entirely different. But for this assessment, it's kind of forced you down that pathway. So it's a little bit of a limitation, but your process sounds excellent. You know, it's really good. Anybody else done something a little bit different? Colin, it's Jackie. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can hear you, Jackie, yes. Um, what I did with mine is I've got um, mainly Indigenous children, so I set up three little experiments and just got um, their reactions. Like I got them to predict what might happen. Then I got them to tell me what they thought happened. And then I just wrote that all down in the table and um, assessed what they might need to learn from that, especially around the language. That sounds fabulous. What a lot of work for you. Yeah, that is very well done. Really good interpretation, particularly um, because it's connected very much to your learners, Jackie. That was really well done. Very insightful. Thank you. Yeah, does anybody else have another version of what they've done? And what I like about the two examples so far is there's, there's been real consideration of the learner. Um, what do my learners do? How do they do it? Um, how do they express themselves? How can I capture and interpret that? I mean, two really good considerations there. They're very, very good teacher moves. And, and I applaud them. Well done. Moving on to formative assessment. Again, the, the, you know, I'm not going to talk in depth about this because the content lecture does. Um, but it's about teaching on the fly. And, and it's feedback that will assist changes in the construction of the student's final deep understanding. Now, the three models I use with diagnostic is you basically the sage on the stage. You're up there, you're gathering, herding the cats, you know, capturing the ideas, bracketing all that knowledge, capturing the knowledge, and then you take it away and bracket and, and look at how you're going to teach it as concept. So you're the sage on the stage. In the second stage where you're doing formative assessment, you're the meddler in the middle. You're walking around, you're prodding and poking the learning bear. You're saying to the kids, why did you do that? What do you think will happen if this does? If, okay, if I do this to this, what do you think will happen to that? Okay, so there's, you're asking the kids, you're the meddler in the middle, you're actually pushing their thought processes around. And you know, you're doing it on the fly. So you can be working with students in collaborative groups. One group may be nailing everything completely and, and have full science understandings. And then you go around and you may extend that through your questioning or through your prompting as the meddler in the middle. And then you may come to a group that's got no idea. And you may step that group backwards backwards down its knowledge framework, right back to the early stages of Bloom's taxonomy, where you may talk about the knowledge ideas here. Oh, you know, can anyone like to explain what this might mean and get them to have a look at it? And each of you write down what you think. Okay, now you tell us, you share. Okay, and between that, you can say, okay, well, so it's this, it's this and this. What else might it be? What is missing from that description? Get them to think and fill in their own gaps. Formative assessment, okay, learning can be broken down into small steps with an assessment dimension. And, you know, as a teacher, we know what we're teaching. We know where we're taking them, where the journey's heading. So we can actually scaffold it down. We can break it into small steps. And that's the role of formative assessment. Summative assessment usually comes at the end. It's the big Batman in the closet. It jumps out and usually mugs small children. Um, but it doesn't have to be like that. Um, you know, it, it can actually be peer-based. Um, it can be a, an investigation or it can be uh, an experiment um, where they actually get to work through and, and formulate their own hypotheses and test their hypotheses and then um, observe another group doing it and they can assess another group and then they sit down and they review both, both um, sets of performance and they, they write up their own understanding of what happened.
So we can look at summative assessment. You know, it can it obviously involves a grade. Obviously, it's about the end result. But there's two key principles for summative assessment. The first one is quality. And we've got that here. It's more important to have few quality assessment items that are effective in discriminating and measuring student understanding. Discriminating and measuring. Rather than having lots of items that are similar, you know, okay, we've done this lesson, we've done that investigation, here's a multiple choice test. We've done this one, okay, here's a concept check. You know, have many that are varied. And that's the second principle is variety. Um, the, the techniques need to be varied and they need to be um, broad based. Um, and in your assessment, yeah, you need to design for learning. You know, here we've got Wenger again. Um, we need to design for a range of learning capabilities. Um, even those students um, who can't uh, get the science concepts, they may actually be very well skilled in, in, in graphing or, or, or in data logging or in a whole range of skills that, you know, when science inquiry skills. So that they may be strong in those, but, but weak in their science understanding. Our assessment must give them an opportunity to succeed no matter what we do, because our aim is to keep students in the game, to keep them engaged, you know, to, to continue them in, in their development as scientists in their own lives. In, in the content session this week too, I talk about assessments having a different purpose. Um, and we can see here, this is taken from the, the Science by Doing website, um, and the great work they do, and they do it so well that you know, really, um, there's no much, not much point going beyond that. And when you do um, you know, finish your degree, Keep your membership to them up because there's just so many ready-made units on there that you can pluck down and no matter what your learner age group, you can actually adjust them and, and, and backward chain them to, to any learning level. It's really, they're really good units. And, and the key here is that learners can only assess themselves when they have sufficiently clear picture of the targets of their, that the learning is meant to, to attain. So when you're moving towards self-assessment, this category over here, we notice it can be done formatively and summatively. Okay, it can be, you can actually get peers, and I've often used this technique when someone's doing a class presentation, or for instance, you do an online conference where students do presentation, they record them video, video recording, you post it as an online conference, and then you spend a, a two hour session or an afternoon where you make it available to the students, you get together, you have a lunch, common lunch, um, we open the conference, and then people move from computer to computer looking at each other's um, um, presentations or they go to a particular website where they can actually view a range of presentations. They can comment on the presentation. You can have a dynamic ongoing repository. So we can see all of this self-assessment can be used in a range of different ways. Interviews and portfolios, great methods. I mean, with my learners, I love to set up a portfolio and it can be both formative assessment and, and uh, summative. Um, the interviews, and that's why I always match interviews with portfolios. I do the diagnostics in an interview with the students and I combine these two things and all of a sudden I can ticking all boxes. I've got a comprehensive assessment regime, which actually also allows me to report. What I cover in those interviews represents a summary and data. Okay, this is my conferencing, and then I can conference with the learner, and I can conference with the learner's parent or guardian. Concept maps, one of those great ones you can see can fit any of them. Diagnostic, formative, summative. Notebooking, again, I actually think it can be summative as well. Um, and again, if you combine notebooking with interviews, you've definitely got a summative assessment task. Rubrics, pretty hard. You've got to, as, as you see here, to use a rubric, people have got to know what they're doing with the rubric. So you've got to do a fair bit of uh, upfront work, but it can be used formatively and summatively. Peer review, again, formatively and summatively. Um, you can combine peer review, for instance, with a student report or presentation, and you could finish up with a summative item as well. Have, have a, students you know, assessing, create an assessment panel. The panel has to give feedback to each presenter, and you can rotate students between presentation and, and panel modes. There's a range of ways that you can combine your, your assessment tasks. Just think about it, assessment doesn't have to be boring. Assessment can be very, very exciting and very, very progressive. Um, so when you're thinking about it, particularly bear this in mind as we slip into assessment task number two from week six onwards, because what we're doing there is we're looking at two continuous units of chemical or physical sciences, and you're actually reviewing the assessment tasks in those two units. So you know, bear that in mind that assessment can play a range of purposes that we can value add to assessment simply by mixing and matching what we do. So how did we get NAPLAN? A really, really good question. Um, you know, it, it, everything, it, of course, the, the politics of the, the US, you know, it, all of a sudden the US went, went backwards in its educational thinking and it went to standardized tests and standardized curriculum. 
Um, and then, of course, that wasn't such a terrible move in its own right. But then everybody began to adopt the standardised test as the standardised curriculum and began to teach the tests. So knowledge, comprehension, all of these wonderful inquiry skills, awe, wonder, you know, the difference between green and grey completely went out the window. And we're left with this standardised you know, um, functional um, literacy, numeracy um, and, and competency sort of framework. Um, we've got it. We can't get away from it. Um, it takes up a lot of time. It's really interesting discussion from Victoria. They're starting to really question it and so are New South Wales. But we've got ongoing formative assessment within classrooms um, and this, you know, providing feedback. Teachers inform their teaching and, and students to inform their learning. We've got twice yearly reporting. That's a standard in Queensland, twice yearly reporting. Annual testings, three, five, seven, and nine. Okay, and literacy and numeracy conducted as NAPLAN. And you know, this produces useful national information. It does. Um, but, you know, when we're teaching to the test, um, we're starting to get the results from that. We're starting to see our educational standards, like the American ones we borrowed it from, going backwards. On the last NAPLAN test, for instance, literacy and numeracy capabilities, I think in years eight, sorry, in, in years nine, um, years uh, uh, seven, and year five went backwards. So, you know, it, you've got to ask yourself, really, is NAPLAN the model that we need to, to be working with? Because it really just strips time spent from other areas in class. And, and when you look at the, the pressure on a teacher, we've, we've got a, a core curriculum. It's compulsory. You now, we're required to teach components of it equally, uh, if not equally, certainly hierarchically. So we're dealing with our core literacy numeracy components and then building the others on top of that and integrating them. So the more time we're spending teaching to satisfy external requirements, the less time we're spending with our learners. And this is a tension, you know, and it's nothing I can do to help um, sort that. It's probably nothing you can do to help sort that other than to you know, work out how you're going to respond to it in your practice as a classroom teacher. The final thing I want to talk about is links to assessment. And I've put this checklist up there and I'll talk about it in the, in the, um, the, the content lecture too. Um, but when you're looking at assessment task number one, here's a couple of things to ask yourself, you know, how you've gone with, with this learning sequence that you're putting together. Had a lot of questions about the learning sequence. You know, does it have to be lesson plans? No, it doesn't. Okay, your learning sequence is simply to address a misconception. Now, what is the, the one rule we have about science? Well, it follows an inquiry process. It can be four C's, it can be POE, it can be you know, exploratory, redescribe, application as Loxley uses. It can be the five E's. You're talking about a learning sequence. So what are you going to do at each of those stages? That's what your sequence is to address the misconception. Have you uncovered the misconception, this box number one here? Have you uncovered it? Have you uncovered the student's current level of understanding or skill? Have you incorporated a range of assessment strategies to try and get to the bottom of this? You know, have you done this diagnostically? How are you going to do it formatively? How are you going to do it summatively? Work through these. Consider them and just in light of your own. And if you can give yourself a tick in each box, congratulations. Okay, it means the assessment task number one is complete. If you're unsure or vague about what that box means, Chat to someone, call someone. Down here, consider opportunities for working with colleagues to design the unit of work. Now, so often um, in our university studies, we complete a wonderful piece of work. And, and I know in this cohort, there are some very, very bright students and the results will be excellent. But those results are basically you know, completed by you as a student, marked by my marking team, and then filed away. You know, why not circulate? Why not share? Is there something I've missed? Here is my learning sequence. You know, can I point you to stage number two? Because I think I might be missing something there. Can you advise? What do you think? How will that work? Can you make any... Work together. You may as well work together now because when you get into schools, you will be looking for each other. Okay, so develop those skills now. Become part of that PLN, that professional learning network, right now. Circulate your work. Share it. Okay, this task is so complex. You've got your own misconception. You've got your own learners. Yet there's no way that we, we, what we're doing here is allowing the watering down or the sharing of knowledge um, and the adapting or appropriating of someone else's work. This is about professional sharing. You know, how can you consider this? How can you share and get it out there? And so that, that check sheet, um, you'll actually see a slide in, in the, um, the Zoom session link on, on uh, the homepage under assessment. And I've actually put this slideshow in there so you'll have access to that, that assessment checklist 
or you can basically just go through and have a look at yourself. How have you incorporated opportunities for frequent feedback? How do you ensure that Evans student learning will serve as a guide for the next stage of your learning? Okay, and here's the question that goes back to what Maxine and Loretta were saying. I can't be sure, but I have a strong hunch that this is my misconception and this is another misconception that may pop up. Here is my design highway. Here is the misconception arterial that may or I may also need to address. You don't need to address it in this lesson sequence. This lesson sequence is just about tackling your identified misconception. Things that pop up on the way, that's what we call peripherals. That's emergent learning. You'll deal with that as a teacher as you go. So this checklist is quite useful. It comes from science by doing and, and actually asks teachers to think through their assessment tasks. This will also help you, I think, feel more confident about your assessment task number one, that you've actually answered the question. Now, on that note, I'm going to pause and stop and open the floor. Please, nobody fall in. Um, but as I open the floor, can I ask for any further questions, anybody that wants clarification, anybody that wants me to go back and, and can revisit something that I may have said tonight? Um, but I do encourage you to look at the content lecture as well, because this, this Zoom session goes hand in hand with it. Um, and you'll find some overlap. I'll say some things twice, and the reason I say that is not because I'm forgetful, but because I think they need to be said twice, just in case that you know, some people miss them. Any questions? Colin, I have a question. Fire away. Who am I talking to? Sorry, I've switched off the, the, um, the, the, the connector there, so I can't see any names pop up. Amanda. Amanda. Fire away, Amanda. Um, I just wanted to check with the five E's. I was looking at doing my lesson sequence in that. However, when I get to explore and explain, um, I've got them doing some hands-on uh, hands activity where there is a little bit of a formative um, assessment opportunity there but it's more on the process and understanding and observational skills and then I want to go back and explore again and explain looking at a formative assessment where they where I look at more technical terms is that okay if I go back and forth a little bit with the explore and explain absolutely look there, there are some educational theorists Jack Mesenro for instance and, and um, um, the guy with double loop learning, um, Agyrus, um, they, they talk about these concepts where, you, you know, you introduce something once, you teach it once, and then it's almost compulsory to go back and explore and explain again. Um, they call it rehearsal, and it's totally legitimate, Amanda. It's a great strategy. Okay. I just felt, because they're, it's a younger group, that I really wanted them to grasp that concept, but try it in a, in a different way again, and then report their findings a little bit more independently. Lovely. So you're kind of upping the skill level as well. So the, the science inquiry skill level is going up while the, the process skills are, are being reinforced. Look, that sounds like excellent teaching, Amanda. Okay, good. Thank you. You're on the right track. Well done. Um, hi, Colin. It's just Bronwyn. Hi, Bronwyn. Um, hi. Um, just a quick check. I've already done a, a lesson plan as I like a two, I'm going to do another lesson plan. Does that matter or do you want it as a sequence? No, it doesn't. If you're comfortable and you think you're getting your message across using lesson plans, then the nice thing about lesson plans is they're very specific, aren't they? They break down. They've got, yep. your, got your intent and you, yep. you've got your activities. So it's going to explain it just as well. The okay. reason why I say you don't have to do lesson plans is because, you know, you don't have to. Okay. But if you're yep. doing them, they're yep. yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Not a problem. You're not on the wrong track, definitely. I'm just saying you don't have to do them. I have to do them. Okay, thank yeah. you. Wonderful. Any other questions from people? Hi, Colin. Colin, it's Helena here. Hello, Helena. Um, now, my, I've done my lesson sequence, and in that lesson sequence, I've identified that there could be um, variations in the results. Um, I'm doing um, friction. Yes, they definitely could and, be. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it could be like that the children have um, used uh, their rubber a different angle or there's not as much surface area or that sort of stuff. So I've identified that these could be contributing factors in getting a different result and that we could then also investigate as to why they got a different result. Brilliant. And, and this is the you know, Mizzen Rose and Argyris' concept of double loop learning going deeper. Brilliant. Um, Colin, I just have a 
a question, sorry. Um, so most of my lessons that I've actually done is in, in the explore and um, explain phase. Is that okay? And then, because that's where I've decided to target most of my material. I just want to know, is that okay? That's absolutely fine, Maxina. And as long as you explain that in, in your, your presentation, fantastic. Um, and then, you know, you can really, really water down the final two stages and just sort of say, you know, we would then go into the, you know, the, the latter stages of the five E's models and just, just, I, yeah. Because also just one quick other question with the elaborate stage, I just kind of set up, it's just like a worksheet, but, but I thought they could do it separately. Um, and it's just about them identifying gaps. It's actually bringing all the explore together and explain phase. So I thought that could be a summative assessment for them to just do. And then I could have see if they understand. Is that also okay? They don't actually have to do it, do they? Uh, no, I mean, they don't have to do it as part of this assignment. But, but in practice, um, I mean, usually when we look at elaborate, we're, we're focusing a little bit on the science inquiry skills there. And, you know, if your worksheet is driving some sort of inquiry process, um, definitely, that, that's a, a wonderful fit. Um, if it's a summative piece um, it, at the elaborate stage, it usually applies to, to, to inquiry skills. Um, a summative piece at, at the evaluate stage usually applies to um, process skills. So um, there's a slight differentiation there. It's not that critical, um, but definitely you're not on the wrong track. But I'd probably need to, to see what you're doing just to make any, any further comment. But it definitely, it sounds like you're on the right track. Um, but when we look at the elaborate stage, we're usually talking about um, you know, science inquiry skills, at the summative assessments done there, you know, getting them to do the skills right and the inquiry process right, the data logging, understanding the difference between continuous and discrete variables. Um, what would we use? Would we use a chart? Would we use a graph? Would we use a line graph? Why? All these kinds of questions that you can get into with, with science inquiry skills. Quite deep questions, you know, but um, yeah, so I don't know whether I've answered your question there, but it doesn't sound like you're on the wrong track. It sounds like you're on the right track, but, but definitely, um, you know, th think about elaborate stages, usually inquiry skills um, as they're, they're, they're applying the concepts and developing the inquiry skills hand in hand. I'll go and read my assessment. I think I, I, think I kind of understand what you're saying. But yeah. Now, Andy, look, if you want a second view, just send it in and I'll, I'll go over it for you and, and just give you some feedback. Thank you, Colin. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. All right, if there's no other questions, we might um, hit the uh, stop record button on this. And Sorry, um, Colin. Fire away. It's Amanda. I've just got one more question. Um, with the elaborate stage, I had an idea, and I just don't know whether it's I'm taking it too far. Um, I'm doing the water cycle, and I wanted to add a couple of elements to it just to get to further their critical thinking um, and talk about the sustainability. And I wanted to do things like in a model, at a house, at a car park, at a factory or something like that, and then start asking them questions um, about how that is going to affect the, the water cycle that we've been learning about. Is it too far? No, no, it, look, it's not. Um, I mean, what I, I mean, instantly what comes to mind there would be jigsawing, um, giving each, each different group um, a different uh, scenario to investigate um, the water cycle and how it operates and, and, and functions, um, and then bring them together in the, in the final stage where they're doing the evaluation, where they may do a presentation to the rest of the class based on what they found. Um, so you, you, there's, there's ways of opening up, um, you know, the elaborate stage, opening it right up as you're trying to do and get as many real life applications covered as you can for the learners. And then also closing it down in the final stage in that evaluate stage where they're, you know, they're becoming peer assessors, they're becoming co-learners very much at that final stage. So, you know, the danger with opening something right up is being able to close it down. So that's the only thing I'd say, think about what your next stage might be, but, but definitely you're going big. Um, but if you're going big, have a pedagogical model that will suit that, something like jigsawing, and then you can actually bring it back to the core by getting them to present to each other in, in like a small mini conference or they can video record their presentations and create a, a web page where you post each of the presentations and you can have a little virtual conference. Um, think about how you want to do that, but definitely open it up. Great strategy. Um, the danger is then managing it and leading it to your learning outcomes. And that puts that little bit of extra pressure on you to do that. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I was, um, 
I just wasn't sure because we're doing so many things focusing purely just on the, the water cycle in the explore and explain. Um, I wasn't sure, yeah, if I put it in elaborate where I was, if I was just pushing it too far for them. Um, but yeah, I've, I do need to think about how to rein that in then because the evaluative stage didn't really have that in it. It was purely more on the water cycle itself. Um, it was just to get their critical thinking because that was one of the misconceptions, or not misconceptions as such, but one of the things that I noticed is they just take it, yep, that's what it is. And yes. they're not thinking about it. Yeah. No, no. They, and that's why it's often taught didactically by teachers. Yeah. Um, look, you sound like you're on the right, and it sounds like a really exciting process. I mean, it's the sort of thing I would do as a teacher. I'd go big and then I'd really have to struggle to, to reel it in. But it can be done and you can pull that evaluation back to a, a peer conference or to a sharing exercise. Um, and you can even get, for instance, design a little assessment sheet for the rest of the class while they're doing their presentation, asking the class how this relates to, to the water cycle. Um, can they identify these key components? Can they identify these key processes? Um, and you know, therefore, it's a learning experience as well for everybody watching the presentation. It's reinforcing um, that, that cycle that you're trying to, uh, to, to get across to them. Yeah, just some ideas there. But look, you're not on the wrong track, but you're right. You are making a challenge for yourself as a teacher by doing that. Um, but wow, imagine your learners, they're not going to be sitting there. They're not going to all be doing the same thing. They're going to be looking at this dynamic thing called a water cycle, how broad it is, how imp impactful it is, um, and, and you know, therefore why it deserves to be in our curriculum and deserves to be studied as a thing of science. You know, it's, it's, it's a really good message to give them. All right, on that note... Um, any other questions before we, we close down and hit the record button? Right, everyone's gone extremely quiet. All right. I'm All good. Thanks, Colin. Oh, look, that's great. Thank you. Thanks I very much. thought for a minute there the session had shut down without me knowing. But look, no, thank you all. And thank you all. And, and look, I look, I wish you all the best. If there's any last minute problems and hiccups, please email me. I'm not an ogre, I live in the real world, and if you're having problems, don't despair. Reach out, please talk to someone that actually will support you and help you reach a solution. And you've got my support, everything in my capacity I can do. Um, so if something goes horribly wrong at the last minute, don't sit there and panic. First thing, just jump on the email and say, look, this has happened. And then, then we can mediate a solution. So nothing's insolvable. We're all adults. Um, we can get through this and, and hopefully um, really enjoy it. Hopefully it's meant to be enjoyable. Um, thank you all. Um, I will record this and post it and I wish you all a, um, a safe week and a, a happy submission on come Thursday. Thank you again. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Thanks, both. Colin. Thanks, Colin. Colin, after you finish recording, I've got a question for you that's not related to the assessment. If I can ask you, please. Definitely.